Can AI and Hollywood get along? Today, we're going to be talking to a fantastic AI filmmaker, Chagger Waters, storyteller and producer, 2024 winner of Curious Refugees AI Esports Tournament, and also Cinema Synthetica's AI Filmmaking Challenge. We'll be discussing storytelling and AI, her award-winning short film, Love at First Spy, and also some current topics regarding the use of AI in creative industries. Let's go ahead and let's dive in. How do you end up in an e esports battle of AI filmmaking. I didn't even know that existed. How did you end up there? Yeah, I didn't know it existed either. Um, but Curious Refuge is a uh, educational resource and community. Uh, we are on Discord and I joined Curious Refuge's AI filmmaking course in January and saw that they were having this event in Vegas after NAB show. And I went out to Vegas in April and uh, ended up competing in their gamified version of Leonardo uh, that they hosted on the HyperX Arena stage in Vegas, which was so much fun. <laughs> mm -hmm. And how does it work? Like, would you get a prompt on something they wanted you to create and then like you'd compete with other people on a limited amount of time? Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. Uh, well, each of the rounds were only 60 seconds long. So we had exactly a minute to uh, complete a prompt that they either gave us, and then we would tweak it using um, the real-time canvas tool in Leonardo. Uh, but it, for a few of the rounds, there was like a reference photo, you know, where it was like a cow standing on the side of a barn, and you would have to prompt it yourself, but try to match that image as closely as you can, which for anyone who hasn't played around with these tools, um, you can usually get a general sense of of your prompt, but there's not a lot of control yet. It's getting better um, about exactly where the placement is of the image. So some, the real-time canvas tool, Leonardo, for example, allows you to kind of rudimentary sketch uh, where an, the subject is in your photo. Um, and yeah, it was it was a lot of fun. There were 16 contestants. I competed with uh, so many people in the AI community that I respect um, and have now made friends with. And uh, the win was unexpected, but so cool. And uh, in the gaming arena, you know, there, there's a live audience aspect to this. So there was definitely like a, a performance element, um, developing a relationship with the audience as each round, you know, the stakes got higher for me. And you know, making eye contact with them, engaging with the the audience as a performer uh, made it really fun. And that interactive element definitely makes this idea of like generative AI esports or gen battles, as they're now kind of being called, mm -hmm. uh, so much fun. Kind of like a rough battle. Mm -hmm. One thing you mentioned uh, when I actually let's give some you know, some context to our listeners and sure. folks watching. I met Jagger at AI on the Lot, where she was presenting Love at First Fight, which is a short film we'll discuss in a minute. But I remember, if if I remember correctly, you said kind of like this, you know, that you were saving like, like the special tricks right before the end because you knew that it would woe the audience. For the esports competition that that ended up being the case. I, I wasn't consciously doing that, but in the early rounds, you know, I was down to the wire trying to make my image look better. And then there was like a last minute shift at the last couple seconds uh, that would put me in the lead or it just, it looked better than my fellow competitors. Um, and I caught on to that by the end and I, I did save them. By the last round, I knew I was like, I'm gonna save my like last edits for those last couple seconds to kind of build up audience so anticipation. <laughs> Mm -hmm. So the humanity was there supporting your AI storytelling, you know, some some of the old performing tricks. Well, that's the that's kind of the ironic part is that, um, you know, AI has a reputation for being sort of inhuman or cold. But, you know, the opposite couldn't be more true with this, the, the human community that has centered around around AI uh, is very warm and inviting and welcoming. And speaking of this human element. <laughs> One of the things that caught my attention about Low at First Fight is that it's not kind of like, you know, generating the image on AI and that's our shot. But you folks actually shot everything using real actors yourself. And I had your partner's name somewhere. Yes. I think it's, <laughs> but I'll forget. So, so sorry. I'll put it here on the screen. Uh, but tell me a little bit more like about how you folks got together. This, how this project came out and 
how was the decision on, okay, let's go with actors first, and then we turn that into an AI element that we sure. use to tell a story? Yeah. Um, well, the the short films that we presented at AIM a lot last week uh, were part of a Cinema Synthetica 48-hour generative AI filmmaking competition that the producers of AI on the lot put together. Um, in the previous weekend, uh, we all met at a house and we had ChatGPT assign us into three groups of three. So AI actually delegated uh, the teams. And we were given uh, the same script that was written by Emmy Award winning creator Bernie Sue. And the script that he gave us, you know, it was just dialogue, no action, no character names, because all of that was for us to create on our own. And I was paired with Nem Perez and Adriana Vecchioli and uh, two incredible AI creators. And um, I, I'm trying to remember why we landed on shooting live action, but it felt like a very natural decision. Um, and Adri Adriana and I were the actors that we used uh, and we went out on the beach and we shot the entire thing. Uh, and we we created our B-roll in mid-journey and upscaled it in Magnific and used it runway to create sort of like motion and B-roll and location. Uh, but we shot the whole, you know, the, it was an AI filmmaking competition, but it felt very much like being on a traditional film set in a lot of ways. So uh, how do you come up with the workflow for that? It was so fast. I'm trying to remember how we even delegated. It was just, we just kind of, kind of had to get going. Um, and Nem had a camera and he shot, he directed and edited. And I remember when I first read the script, you know, we, we just did like a very quick cold read of the script uh, before we broke off into our groups. And I immediately started scanning it for joke opportunities. And I was like, okay, here's a joke opportunity. Here's a joke opportunity. That's my strength. I have strength of comedy and I think for sh something like short form com short form content comedy is a really good idea and was hoping that I also wrote I remember wrote it, writing down uh horror comedy cannibalism on the script <laughs> which is just what I had in mind and eventually that that escalated into this like zombie rom-com or as we call it zomcom genre that we ended up going with and yeah I think that using footage with human acting really grounded it. And I remember watching a very first rough cut of the footage that we shot and thinking that the theater of it all was really successful, that even without the style transfer that we did later, you could see that there were two characters that had a relationship, they had a dynamic, there was tension before any of the dialogue even started. So that brought something very human that I think helped recover from that uncanny valley that can happen with a lot of the AI visuals, particularly faces, lips, all that. Um, and that being said, our our short film is is it's fun, it's funny, but it's also full of AI hallucinations. Um, there's a, several shots where the face is on the side of the head or on the back of the head, and you know it's it's far from technically perfect. Um, but again, we had. 48 hours, which is one thing, and focused on the grounded human relatable story. Yeah, I was definitely interesting <laughs> because I remember the three short films with the same script, the three of the films took a very different approach, right? The first one was a drama. The second one, I don't remember, but it was amazing. <laughs> and then it came the love at first fight and people went nuts, right? Yeah, I could see yeah. the faces of everyone. Everybody was having a, a good time. And there were some imperfections, <laughs> but also there's always a trade-off with speed, right? Which leads me to the question, as an artist, how were you able to be in that theater knowing that you were presenting sort of like a first trap, right? Uh, yeah. How do you handle yeah. that? Yeah. I mean... I think, I think comedic timing goes a long way. And we just, it, it, I think all three of us were just kind of playing off of our instincts. And even with a little bit of the acting that I did, I kind of knew to be bigger and make, make, make more dramatic physical motions that would probably survive the style transfer that we did um, on top of the footage translate really well or there was a shot where I turn and I look at camera and my eyes get really big and I knew to be extra expressive with it um just as we were playing around with the different 
visuals and the way that we were going to make us look like zombies um, with without traditional VFX, without makeup or anything like that. So it came out great and humor definitely goes. I think even the imperfections played a role yeah. in making the humor well, hit I think harder. It, I think it works because this this stuff is weird there there's a there's a psychedelic aspect to the ai content you know it it we can tell it's different and off and i think that leaning into the humor and letting it be that way uh works to our advantage um and i'm mm -hmm. just i'm also blow, just so blown away by the other groups and the the pieces they created uh they were called heartwired and father time and uh those pieces which will be available to view as well as love at first bite um i'm just excited to share all of the pieces with the world and i'm blown away by everybody's work uh, whenever those pieces are live out there please let me know because I'll be sure to add them to the description. I want folks to watch this short film because it's definitely fun and a great <laughs> way of showing what you can do with AI. But now that you say, you know, the Uncanny Valley, what I like is that it, you know, how now it looks like AI. It's going to be an insult now. Like yeah. it's kind of like whenever I read something, I hope no one thinks it, it's AI. Like I'll leave yeah. like grammar, grammatical mistakes. So <laughs> you're thought to be anarchic. In a good way, like you said, you know, it 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 was a strength. Um, yeah. Well, and the, 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 I remember learning that the panel of judges for this particular challenge were uh, a lot of them were TV executives or they have experience in television. And all of the meetings that I've had with TV executives over the years, I know that they look for story and relatable character. That's the first thing they're looking for when they watch content. Um, so that kind of played to our advantage as well. And you've been doing this for... 10 years, if I'm not mistaken, and you've done it for in several formats, right? Like you've written tip for TV, you've written podcast, you've done extended reality and amended reality. Through all of that, the common thread storytelling. So yeah. do you approach it in a different way, depending on the format? Well, I think that storytelling is storytelling. Um, and that's true for marketing. It's true for narrative content. And I turned my attention to AI last year during the writer's strike because it was such a hot topic during strike negotiations. Mm -hmm. And rather quickly, when I was educating myself on these tools, I was like, oh, I, I think that this is something to embrace, not run from. And I made that choice. And I'm so glad that I did. And right now in the, the AI spaces, uh, at least in LA, uh, is... It's a wonderful community. It's a lot of VFX artists, designers, um, visual artists, graphic artists. Um, but I haven't encountered too many other like writer directors who are coming directly from, um, I guess, more traditional entertainment. And I hope to see more of us uh, populate those spaces because I think right. that our that experience with storytelling that we have from television, from narrative podcasts, uh, it can really translate, and we can become really great collaborators with these artists out there. Mm -hmm. And what's really interesting to me is that it, this, uh, you know, what you're saying that it's mostly visual effects. They say no one uses AI in Hollywood, but then they go to the bathroom <laughs> and come up with amazing ideas, right? Yeah. So I think under the hood, um, everybody's using AI in some sort of way. Yeah, Personal. there was a <laughs> there was an article a couple of days ago, I think Variety or Hollywood Reporter, where it's like, oh, yeah, they're using AI, just nobody's talking about it. Mm -hmm. um, or even yesterday, I saw that um, Anya Taylor Joy did a, a press piece uh, or an interview where she talks about the use of AI in Furiosa. Um, so it's becoming more normalized, I think. Yeah, I think I saw a film recently last night. Can't remember the name right now. My memory is shot today. Uh, but they got in a lot of trouble for using AI. Uh, it was a scary film. Late Night with the Devil? Late Night with the Devil, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, they use AI. I couldn't tell personally. I was just enjoying I, the movie. I couldn't tell either. I saw that. I actually went and saw that in theaters and I didn't notice the moments of AI. Uh, but eventually, you know, generative AI could be really useful for horror. Um, of course, using some of these tools during the filmmaking process, um, we had, you know, we had zombie and like sort of blood covered apocalypse sort of images that we were using uh trying to run it through runway which is the the program that can help animate or create like a very slight motion in b-roll that mm -hmm. you create and it all of it got flagged for violence uh because of the blood 
which mm -hmm. is a use that's an important guardrail to have with these tools but it's also a bit of a shame because it lends itself so well to horror you know the mid germany is it is trippy you know um and i think there's an interesting future of horror filmmaking that's going to come out of this for sure mm -hmm. And I think as you know, AI becomes more normalized within the industry because just like you, uh, I think you know once the cat's out of the bag, it's not going back. You know, you can yeah. fight it, but we're never gonna. Even if you, you know, even the scenario that we were all absolutely right, you know, or like folks are against AI, there's so much money involved that there's no way that they're not gonna find a workaround. So you might as well learn it, you know, and, and be sure we're using it for a good cause. But I think studios will create their own like LLMs with their own guardrails, because as you said, horror films, they could definitely benefit from AI. Yeah. So they, they're gonna build it themselves for sure or get a customized version. Yeah. Um, it's a, so you guys had that challenge to do your in Love at First Fight. With, with the, the, the censorship? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. The there was a there's a sequence that's basically a flashback in the middle of the short film. And the intention was to, you know, bring full motion to those images, but almost all of them got flagged and we couldn't do that. So we had to come up with an alternative and we just did like a very quick, like very fast slideshow um of a bunch of stills that we created to kind of give a tone and a mood. Um and this like quick traumatizing flashback from when this character mm -hmm. became a zombie. Uh, yeah. So besides writing podcast movies <laughs> for TV, you have a substack. One article that caught my attention that you wrote, it's, it's time to gamify Hollywood. So I want to zero in on that article because you're talking about this integration of AI into storytelling and gamifying, for example, all content. So. Would you go a little more into detail about what it exactly means in your view to gamify Hollywood? Sure. Uh, well, that that was something that I was thinking about when I went to NAB show in Vegas. Uh, there were several panels of former television executives that were sort of embracing AI and they were like, well, we're sitting on all of this older television content or old movies that we want to repurpose, you know, as a business, you want to use things that are sitting on your shelves and try to you know, squeeze, squeeze more views, uh, more content out of them. And there weren't any direct solutions for how to do that. Um, it was a lot of, there was a lot of talk of, of, of we want to do that. And like, how can we engage a younger audience uh, with a show that was shot in the sixties or seventies? And I don't have that answer yet. And neither did anybody on these panels. <laughs> so um, I don't, I don't necessarily know how, traditional television will be gamified. But I think the the broader philosophical uh, idea that I was getting at here is that traditionally cinema is presented to an audience that can't really interact with it. There's a limited amount of interaction that you can have with it. Other than telling other people that you loved it, other than going to see it multiple times in the theater, that's the limit of your relationship with that content. Um, but whereas something, you know, the gaming industry is dependent on interaction. It invites you to participate and be part of it. And that's what interests me so much in extended reality and um, sort of continuous narrative storytelling that's woven through something that's a little more choose your own adventure, a little bit more that reaches out and, and asks the audience to participate instead of just sit back and, you know, say like, we're here to tell you this story, but you're just here to watch it. Um, and I think that there is a necessary shift to in maintain and also increase engagement um, from users and viewers. And whatever the solutions are that are still being created, um, I think present a really exciting new frontier for, for entertainment, for films. Yeah. Uh, I'm not going to put you in this spot because you already said you don't have that answer, right? Yeah. Uh, I definitely don't like, believe me, I read your article and I was like, how would she do that? And I've been thinking about it. I actually had the hopes she would yeah. explain, but we'll follow up in a couple of months. Yeah. I just, <laughs> I think it's, I think there's a, it's that the, the aura, the attitude of, of filmmaking of Hollywood is very, you know, there's a finite amount of resource and when you're granted those resources, then you can make your film. 
Um, and there is a lot of, there's so many barriers to entry and the, the process of making a film is nothing short of a miracle um, because of how difficult it is, because of how much money you need, uh, because of the team that you have to assemble. So that has created, uh, I, I think, a reputation of, of, of distance with the audience of, hey, we're over here making things for you, uh, but we decide what's good. We decide what we green light. We decide what we make. And then you come and see it. And um, that's changing because I think audiences and users want to have a more direct relationship with whatever content they're consuming. Have you seen anything remotely <laughs> kind of heading that direction from content that it's already existing besides gaming, right? Well, I heard, um, I'm th I am have to finish the whole episode, but I'm listening to uh, the Virtually Everything podcast, which I did a little spot on earlier this week. Oh, and sweet. yeah, the, the most recent episode that Peter, the host, talks us through is he talks about upfronts, which happened recently, and how the sort of most exciting content that came out of upfronts was like YouTube and Netflix talking about user-generated content as the future of entertainment. And that, I think that's something I would direct people towards, you know, listen to that episode, uh, dive in on it more, but that's not surprising. Um, because again, I think YouTube and Netflix are looking to have that greater user engagement and interactive element in their content. Yeah, Netflix is definitely going all in on gaming. Yeah. They say the New York <laughs> Times, it's kind of like a gaming company now. That's... that's that's the one I was thinking of, right? That now, according to the SEC, <laughs> very official report that more mm -hmm. people use New York Times for gaming, uh, specifically for Wordle, than they do reading news. So now New York Times is a gaming company. <laughs> I love Wordle. So that's yeah. that's the whole extent of my relationship yeah. with the New York Times. Yeah. Um, so you're talking, you know, about the audience going sort of like from a static consumption to interactive engagement. And my first thought hearing that, and again, also as someone that has an artistic mind, you know, I love reading music, films, the whole thing. It gets a little scary. So I'm assuming in your conversation, especially in someone that has been so explicit about embracing AI in an industry that it's a bit more reticent, have you noticed gatekeeping or even pushback from folks in the industry about AI and the audience being more of a protagonist in how the story goes? Those aren't conversations that I'm hearing a lot about right now, but I think the pushback is just about using the tools at all and the fear of being replaced, the 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 legal gray area in a lot of this content, which does need to be explored and ironed out a little bit more. And yeah, I think that I hope to see more writers and directors starting to embrace it, not as a replacement for creating full length content, I don't, uh, you know, I'm not going to use generative AI to make a full length film or a full length pilot. That's not where I see it to be most beneficial for my work. Uh, but I think these tools, using these tools to create proof of concept art, uh, to show executives as an example of the creative direction that you want to go in, not to serve as a, a, the permanent final imagery to use, but to give a creative executive an idea of the vision of the world of the characters um, and being able to create those those materials at a faster pace. Because as a writer, um, spending all your time on one project and only wanting to pitch one project at a time, you, your odds aren't very good. You Ideally, you, you have a dozen, you know, like 12 to 15 different projects. And, you know, the, the process of creating art for all of those without generative AI would be extensive. It would take a long time. It would be rather and would be rather expensive. Um, so now writers or directors or anybody with a vision for creating video content of any kind that they need to pitch to somebody uh, can use these materials to to create that visual world and, uh, I think, increase the chances of selling your own work. Mm -hmm. um, one of the upsides that I see, you know, one, one of the things I dislike about the movie industry right now is that it seems that it's either reboots or Marvel movies. So one of the uses that I see for AI, like you said, it's kind of like enabling a lot of independent filmmakers 
to have these resources so they can tell stories that are representing maybe different niches. I'm really excited about that. And you mentioned something which is like executives or the C-suite have this fantasy that they will replace us all, you know, and in their mind yeah. they can do a reboot forever. But Renard Jenkins, I remember his his talk at the AI on the lot. He's a senior vice president at Warner for those that are not familiar with him. He said, there's going to be a rebirth, you know, which entails destruction of the industry. But also if AI is going to replace anyone, it's going to be executives because <laughs> it's going to be much better at doing that job for them that actually creative like you, uh, that as you said, you know, this human factor, you want this AI contest. Why? Because you were connecting with the audience. What would you recommend, you know, to the kids that are getting started, that are creating these TikTok videos? How would you recommend them to embrace AI so they can maybe, if they decide they love storytelling, go into long form or start setting a foot in the industry Yeah. when they might not be able to go, you know, the traditional way? Yeah. Well, I still think the, you know, the basics of storytelling, the basics of, of theater and filmmaking, it all still applies here. So um, learning how to make a storyboard uh, is still important. And, you know, using using a tool like Midjourney to to build the images for your storyboard that then you, you lay out and you're like, okay, this is the visual story of the script that I'm going to write, or maybe I already wrote it, whatever. That's the other thing is that the the traditional workflow of creating film film was created before the internet and that that workflow process could be updated i think in, even in ways that we might not even be able to think of we just haven't incorporated them yet so i think that young people who will play around these tools might totally reimagine the workflow for creating video content in ways that i can't my, my brain can't even wrap it head, itself around right now but... um and yeah i think that it we're, we're going to see it in, you know, in a film where you're like, wait, where was the AI shot? And it's like, oh, it's because it was just the, it was the drone establishing shot over an island or over the country that it, it looked real because it was a very broad, wide shot. And that came, that needed to be AI because they couldn't afford to actually have a drone on set to get the establishing shot. So I think we're going to see AI in, in very small slices in major films and, um, and I'm excited to see more of that. Yeah, I imagine even like enhancing the process of removing something and this thing, you know, it can just, it makes it so easy. It's unreal. Well, easy, faster. Um, and the real reason that I think it's not going anywhere is that it it will save money. Um, it will save, a, a, you know, when a new tool ends up on the marketplace that creates a faster money saving option for anything, we tend to embrace it. How about the aspects it cannot replace? What's the human thing that cannot be replaced by AI? ChatGPT, for example, um, is a great structuring outlining tool. You know, if you brain dump your story into that, it, it can organize it for you in three acts, five acts, however you want to structure your story. Um, but it's still not, it's not very original. And I think the actual, we're always going to be able to tell the difference uh, between story that had human influence versus that that didn't. But I think it's, it's a human machine collaboration, ultimately. And I think that human beings like to interact we like we, we like to create that's why i don't think we're going to sit back and let ai make content for us because i don't think that would interest us i think that we want to have a greater involvement we want to have a bigger role in the things that we create so i think that human machine human ai collaboration um that'll that's the future but probably not it running by itself how do you see your future? What are you working on next? Uh, well, later in early, in early June, I'm I'm performing stand up comedy at Riot Girl Comedy Festival on June sixth in Koreatown in LA. Uh, I'm I still enjoy performing stand up comedy, even though I use AI in some aspects of my creative life. Uh, so, yeah, and I'm coming up with some some AI jokes that I hope uh, that I hope sort of lighten the room and bring a little levity to the the conversation that we're having about it right now. 
through that. I'll check it out. I'm in LA, so <laughs> yeah, I might come to the show. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I will. Yeah. Especially because it's gonna be a first, right? Uh, hearing AI jokes. Um, but yeah, but I think we. Sorry, go ahead. I'm still no. I mean, I'm. I, I think that we're in. We're in this in between liminal space. So, for example, I'm still writing a. I have a, a Christmas comedy feature film that I'm writing. That you know, it's I'm I'm pursuing a traditional avenue of of wanting to to sell that project, and I don't think it would involve any AI. So, I think we're in the space where the old way of doing things still works, and there's a new way of doing things, and. My goal as a creator is to start experimenting with both of those as we as we enter this this interesting sort of branching off of the industry. Mm -hmm. uh, where can people find more about your work? Sure, my my Substack is just jaggerwaters.substack.com, and my Instagram is glamorous reptile. That's where you can find me. Sweet, and we'll have the link for everyone to watch Love at First Bite. I vouch for it. It's a very <laughs> fun short film. I was privileged enough to watch it. So the minute it's live, uh, we'll add the link here to create. Thank you. Robots. It's actually, um, it, it will be part of a bigger documentary that was made about our filmmaking process. So I will send that to you as well. And everyone will be able to sort of watch from behind the scenes how all three of these films were created, um, which the documentary filmmakers followed our process into the event, into the screening, um, and afterwards, which was Yeah, fun. we'll get to see you yeah. uh, and your colleague dancing. I saw there was a lot of dancing uh, on ours, Love at First Fight. Yes, a lot of dancing, a lot of fun. Um, yeah, and again, the just the producers of AI on the Lot, Todd, Mike, Max, Ian, Rachel, the AI LA community, um, late arrivals. Those are the shout outs I want to give everybody. Great. Well, Jagger, it's been a pleasure having you in the podcast. Thanks uh, so much. Hopefully we'll do it again in the future, presenting another film. And I do have a feeling that we'll hear a lot about your name in the upcoming year. So I'm excited to see where your career goes. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for coming to Creativity and Robots. And for the rest of you, remember, if you're listening to the audio version, on Spotify, on Apple Podcasts, please rate us. It goes a long way on getting the algorithm to suggest uh, this podcast to other folks. If you are on YouTube, you know the drill. Like, smash, smash the subscribe button. I think it's smash it like and subscribe. Uh, but anyway, leave comments, ask us what you want to see. And we'll see you next week with another episode of Creativity and Robots, a love letter to human creativity with generative AI as a stage prop. Thank you all and see you next time. Amo la creación en mi pantalla, bits y bytes en danza, todo brilla, cada código que escribo canta, sabor a cumbia.